Well, good evening, friends. Today is December 3rd, 2020. Therefore, we are in Luke's Gospel, Chapter 3, which is all about John the Baptist, pretty much. Both John and Jesus are now grown grown-ups. They're about 30 years old. And did you notice again, as our scene opens here in, in chapter 3, Luke, our author, is lining up our cast of characters again. We'll see that as we continue to journey on. Luke likes you to know who's, who's who and, and where things are happening. And he's a great playwright, really. He, he's a great screenwriter. If this is on the big screen. Luke likes, likes you to know the details. I've always said that as I, I've preached on Luke. Luke is one who's going to let you in on the little details. So we have the cast of characters, both on the social, economic, and political side, as well as the religious side of the fence. And some of these names are going to be familiar to us because we, we see them three years down the road here when Jesus is crucified. He's going to be tangling with um, some of these Pharisees and, and that sort of thing too. So it opens up the 15th year of Tiberius. He's the Roman emperor. We see Tiberius's picture on some coins. Then Pilate is governor of all Judea. We know that, we know about Pilate. Herod Antipas ruled over Galilee. Now those Herods, no matter who, which one, they are all crazy. They are cruel. They kill members of their own family. When Jesus is born, we have Herod the Great. Here is Herod Antipas, his son. He's just as wicked as his daddy. Then we have some of the religious leaders named. Aeneas and Caiaphas, the high priests. So he's got his characters lined up, and then he tells us what's going to happen next. And it says, when a message came to John, son of Zechariah. So we know who the main player is here, John. Then we get a, a passage from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. The voice shouting in the wilderness. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him, the valleys will be filled, and the mountains and the hills made level, the curves will be straightened, and the rough places made smooth, and then all the people will see the salvation sent from God. There's that salvation again, isn't it? So... When kings traveled, there were subjects that rode ahead and made sure that the road was smooth, that there wasn't a big old rock or something in the middle of the road that the, the carriage that was carrying the king was going to hit, uh, protecting the king. Just like we remember that Elizabeth probably went into seclusion to protect the womb, protect John the Baptist, who she was carrying. Well... This is what Isaiah is saying. This, this road, the, prepare the way for the Lord. Smooth away the rough spots. Straighten out the curves because the king is coming. That's what this is. So you can go back and read I, Isaiah chapter 40. Okay. Then it says, when the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you brood of snakes, might be you brood of vipers in some of your translations. Who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sin and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, uh, we're safe. We're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to 
sever the roots and trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. So the religious leaders, they went down to see what John was doing because, of course, news travels fast. Traveled fast back then, just like travels fast today. And so the church guys are, are down at the riverbank listening and watching John. And he says, don't you guys think you're all safe here um, because you claim to be children of Abraham? That doesn't give you a free pass of salvation. It's kind of like we say, well, if you don't go to church, you don't go to heaven. That's, that's not how this goes. That's not how any of this goes. You know, just because you're standing in a garage doesn't make you a car kind of thing. I, lo I love that. So that's what, he, that's what John is getting at. Don't just say, uh, you know, we don't need to be baptized. We don't need to turn away from our sins because we are the church guys. We are children of Abraham. He says that doesn't it no more of that. That doesn't just give you a free pass. A free pass is repenting, a new life, turn from your sins, and be saved. That's what that's getting at. And I love how John calls him out. So somebody yells out, What should we do? Well, John replies, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Again, Luke is always going to lift up the lowly. He's going to lift up the, those that are poor. The low are going to be exalted. The, ex the Those that think they're high and mighty are going to come crashing down. That's what Luke is all about. We'll see that over and over again here in Luke's gospel. Then even the tax collectors, even corrupt tax collectors, came to be baptized and asked, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Well, collect no more taxes than the government requires. You know, in other words, don't pad your pockets. Don't collect the taxes and then, you know, add a little bit in for yourself. Just, just collect what's fair. And that's it. What should we do, asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. Wow, huh? Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John was confused. Uh, uh, people confused John with the Messiah. John is just the warm-up band for the main gig. Always, we need to remember that. John is preparing the way here. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater than I'm not even worthy to be his slave or untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. There again, the, you know, there again, he, he's calling out those who are, think they're all that in a bag of chips and refuse to turn from their wicked ways and be baptized. He says, well, if you're not going to come and, and repent of your sins for me, well, someone greater than I am is coming. I might baptize, I'm baptized with water, but he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Just you watch. Then he will clean up the threshing area, it says, and gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news. There's that good news three times, or twice now. We saw it the first time yesterday with the shepherds. The good news, here's number two. Announcing the good news to the people, John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, 
his brother's wife. We know that gets John beheaded in the end. It's not, don't think it's here in Luke. It might be here in Luke. But uh, that's how John gets ends up. We'll see that in a little bit. Then we get just one small paragraph here in Luke's gospel about the baptism of Jesus. You can find the baptism of Jesus in all four gospels. Matthew and Mark are a little bit more. Matthew is more, most extensive, I think. And uh, I think it's Mark. We get the conversation between Jesus and um, John. So you can look at those. In John's gospel, John is different now, remember. John is what's called a synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic, similar. John is different. But anytime you see a story that is echoed in all four of the gospels, even three, but all four, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. John just mentions it briefly. That, that's all. So take a look at those. So one day when the crowds were be, being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. And as he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly beloved son and you bring me great joy. It's all about peace this week. And so those that get worship bags from me will get dove chocolates to represent peace. Then we get the ancestors of Jesus. We see the genealogy of Jesus in both Luke and Matthew, and there's a couple slight differences. Matthew tells us all about it right away. So what's the big deal with genealogy? Some of you like family history. Just had a cousin of mine on the Newton side of the fence. That was my biological mom's side of the fence, Barbie, my Auntie Barbie's side of the fence. Um, message me a picture from that side. We don't have a lot of cousins left on, on that side of the family. And so I really appreciate the, the connection with him. And, and he is a family historian. He, he loves that stuff. I do too. I love the genealogy. So what's the big deal with genealogy? Well, it tells us who we belong to, where we come from. It, it just, it tells us all of those things. And I think one of the differences, I think, I have to go back and look. No, you can look, you can do this homework for, for yourself, okay? Here in Luke, it starts with Jesus. And then it ends with, Adam was the son of God. I think Matthew has it flipped. You know, it starts with Adam and then goes all the way to, to Jesus. So check that out. But our genealogy just, just tells us who we are and, and where we're from, who we belong to. So there you go. I should have got down here this afternoon because one of our stained glass windows has a picture of John baptizing Jesus, and I should have stood in front of that for you, but anyway. Tomorrow, Jesus begins his public ministry. That's what the baptism kicks off, um, the public ministry. And so we get the temptation of Jesus, then we get Jesus rejected in Nazareth. And that story is going to be really important because it will mirror what we're going to look at, not this coming Sunday, but next Sunday, um, Isaiah chapter 61. Do you understand how all of this is connected? Yeah, you can't get to Jesus without some Old Testament. That's why it's important for us to know our Old Testament history and how we got here in the first place, what brought about all, all of this? It's all significant and it's all interwoven. I love it when that happens, don't you? All right, that's all I have for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed chapter three. What are your observations for that? Why don't you shoot me a, a comment and let me know. Have a good evening. Sleep well. Jesus loves you. So do I. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.